I shall do anything to excise your impurity. Uh, uh, excuse me? What the frick? The frick you won't? <laughs> Heck yeah. Losing my V-card for the win! Gosh dang. Frick me, dude. Thank God someone just got shot. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that in my life, but thank God for that. You mustn't take this lightly, Takumi. Saws. <laughs> oh! Yeah, I get freaking smacked! How's it going, everybody? Hoodlamont here, back with some more Chaos Head Noah. And uh, last time, uh, Ayase may be crazy. She may be a little loony. Because we found out that the, uh, the, the, the book of Psalms and Revelation, or whatever it's called, has no words in it. And we looked up the Gladial uh, Saga, whatever, and it apparently was a fictional series or something that I think didn't even get finished. Uh, but anyway, Ayase has been uh, reading a nothing book, that's all I know. Um... I think I think it was a it was a series. I think we looked it up and it, it said it was a series written by somebody uh or or something like that. But uh and then uh we also found out that Ayase may or may not, I mean, we know she did something, but we don't know who it was, uh killed the Knights of Gladiol, which very well could have been Senna and Kozapi and, and all the rest of them. Uh we just don't know yet. Um, so outside of that, we were fed some food by Ayase, which was kind of wholesome, I guess. And uh, now we're here. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I don't have much more to say other than that. So without further ado, let's just get into this, shall we? When she'd finished feeding me, Ayase had once again started going on about the Gladial Saga. But this time, she really got into it. Even once the sun had started setting, she seemed oblivious to the fact that the room was getting darker. Not once had she thought to turn the lights on. Oh, because there's nothing in the book. <laughs> For the most part, though, she'd pretty much just gone in-depth on the things she'd already mentioned prior to that. Nothing really new. Oh, okay, she's not reading the book, she's just... Talking to us, I got you. And she wasn't exactly the most engaging storyteller. So now, I was starting to get sleepy. Though, considering that Shogun was still out there, it probably wasn't smart to be dozing off. And that is our duty. Do you understand this? Huh? Uh... <clears throat> Uh, uh, yeah. I hadn't listened to a word she'd said, <laughs> but I decided to just nod for now. And when I did, Ayase squinted at me, then moved in close. You were not listening, were you? Oh! <laughs> she usually didn't show much in the way of emotion, but I guess even she could get mad under the right circumstances. Maybe I should apologize for upsetting her. It seems that impurity runs deep within your wicked heart. Oh my gosh! Again! With the wicked hearts! <laughs> nice. I suppose we will have to excise it before we proceed then. The impurity that has eroded your wicked heart. If we do not, purity shall never be able to flourish within you. Uh, excise? What, what was she trying to do to me? By the sound of it, some kind of terrifying heart surgery. It gave me chills just thinking about it. But it seemed like my guess was off. With a slightly sorrowful expression, Ayase licked her lips. I'd caught a quick glimpse of her pink tongue, and I must admit, 
That moment was extremely sexy. Dude, oh no. I should have guessed when the lights turned off. I was just hoping that maybe, you know, they do... Okay. This is what I get for thinking. I shouldn't just... I just... I just need to go instinctually and know. Not that I can save myself, but whatever, I guess. I shall do anything to excise your impurity. Uh, uh, excuse me? What the frick? The frick you won't? <laughs> if there is anything you desire, you must tell me. Uh, anything? Well... I still didn't know what she meant by excise your impurity, but... Well then, how about... Uh... For starters... Would you even... Kiss me? <laughs> Despite the darkness, I could see the rigidness of her expression. Uh-oh. Uh, maybe I'd gone a little too far. I really didn't want her to start hating me, and I definitely didn't want her to abandon me. So I rushed to apologize. Ha! <laughs> or at least, I tried to. But she didn't give me the opportunity. Instead, she grabbed me by the collar and shoved me right into a nearby closet. Uh, uh-huh! Wait, what are you- Shh. Huh? She pressed her body up against mine. And then, she closed the door behind us, leaving us tightly packed inside the closet. Wait, is there someone that was coming? Was it gonna be Sua coming to check on her again? And she's like, we had to hide or whatever. Is that what it's gonna be? The closet was incredibly cramped. It wasn't designed for people. In order for two people to fit, they had to be pressed right up against each other. It didn't help that I could feel Ayase's stifled breaths on my ear, either. Maybe it was how dark it was, but the situation was really turning me on. Oh my gosh, dude. What's going on? The nurses are doing their rounds. Oh. So that's why we were hiding. Visiting was prohibited at night, so obviously sleeping over was too. If they found out I was here, they'd kick me out immediately. Okay, but why was Yase hiding with me? <laughs> there are enemies all around us. Even in this hospital. Enemies? The Harbingers of Gladiol. They lie in wait for any opportunity to subjugate our hearts. Even the nurses were our enemies? Yeah, dude, she just sounds super Chinibio now. <laughs> she sounds like like the whole world is is out to get her and she's like the special main protagonist <laughs> character. That's funny. Uh are you sure that's not just your persecution complex speaking? Quiet! I had no clue what brought it on, but Ayase suddenly sealed my lips with hers. Huh? Oh, whoa! <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Her lips were so soft. It was enough of a shock to make my mind go completely blank. <laughs> that was when I heard the door open, and at the same time, some strange mechanical sound. Whoever they were, they were trying to be stealthy, but I still had heard them come through the door. Oh, it's- yeah, okay, it's Hazuki. Oh, frick, yeah, that would make more sense than- than Suzu. Or Suzu? That would make more sense than, uh, than, what the frick, Sua? I couldn't, I was, I was going to a Suza hop for some reason. Uh, yeah, it would make more sense than Sua, though, okay. She's not here. 
I heard a female voice. I felt like I'd heard it before, but I couldn't exactly remember when. I worry she ran away. Could she have figured us out? Uh, you're right. Perhaps I went a little overboard with how many times I made contact. She was talking to someone, but I couldn't hear the other person's voice. She must have been talking on the phone. Ayase's lips were still glued to mine. Her sweet aroma lingered in the air. It smelled absolutely incredible. They were so soft, and not just her lips, but her breasts, her shoulders, her hips, her thighs. Every part of her body that pressed up against mine was soft as could be. You, dude. There was probably someone really dangerous standing right outside the closet, but that thought didn't even register in my mind. I was completely lost in pleasure. Have you finished your mission? Oh, so that was just one step. I see. It's about time I head for the Scramble Crossing, then. See you later. May the Divine Light save you, Mamaru. What the frick? It seemed like they'd finished their conversation. And with that, the suspicious woman silently left the room. I could tell that the coast was clear. It would probably be safe for us to come out of the closet now. <laughs> but Ayase still hadn't let go of me. And then, for only a moment, she pulled her lips away from mine. She looked at me, tears welling in her eyes. Takumi, I will be your guide. And you will be the messiah. It has been decided. Therefore, I will do anything. Any wish you have, I shall grant it. <laughs> I didn't really get what she was trying to say. I, I, I figured she was probably just spewing her crazy delusions again, but either way, I didn't mind. Takumi. Takumi. Ayase kissed me again. Except this time, it was nothing like before. This time, Ayase's tongue, slick with saliva, forced my mouth open, shoved its way deep inside, and coiled around my own. Ew, freaking, freaking gross, dude! What the frick? Ew! Nothing else mattered to me anymore. I just let myself give in to the pleasure, embracing Ayase's slender, supple hips. <sighs> it was becoming a little hard to breathe. When I tried inhaling, I just ended up sucking in Ayase's hot breaths. Ayase's saliva spilled into my mouth. It tasted incredibly sweet. I swallowed it with audible gulps. Brother, gosh dang! What the frick? Ew! Dude, why are you making me read this right now, dude? Uh, this could have been sweet, and it, they made it grow so quick. Why? It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. Oh, it could have been cute for a second there, but no, of course not. Not in Chaos Head. God forbid. My brain was completely paralyzed mesmerized to the core. I'd never expected the touch of a 3D girl to feel this good. Oh! <gasps> oh! I heard a sharp sound off in the distance. Startled by the noise, Ayase backed away. 
What was that sound? Her lips were soaked in a mixture of our saliva. Even in the darkness, it was clearly visible. I couldn't care less about the sound. I just wanted to go back to making out with Ayase. And if possible, go even further beyond. Heck yeah! Losing my V-card for the win! Gosh dang, frick me dude. Thank God someone just got shot. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that in my life. But thank God for that, I guess. Because golly, oh my gosh. Oh, was that, that couldn't have been Bond, right? Getting shot? There's no way. He was on the rooftop though, wasn't he? Because Ayase ends up, up somewhere near the area where he shot, right? Because they hear it in the, in the distance. But, but was he on AH? Tokyo General Hospital. I think he was. I think he was because because I remember the lobby when you uh, follows him and he's like, go home. Go home, kid. I work alone, you know. So. Uh, OK, so that probably was him getting shot then because that was the mission they were talking about, right? Yeah, that was what that was what Hazuki was just saying. His his mission, what final mission or whatever she said. Anyway, yeah, OK. Wait, hold on. Had Ayase been with other men before? If so, then wouldn't that kind of bring down the whole experience? Or maybe Eroge had just rotted my brain. Uh, it it's done more than that, my friend. I think it's I think it's darn near like disintegrated your entire like never mind, dude. Never mind, man. Never mind. I can't even come up with a good insult. My brain has been rotted. Because of this. This freaking... Uh, never mind. Nah. There was no way Ayase had past experience. No normie would want to stick their thing in someone this crazy after all. I mean, even Miss Me couldn't have run away from her. You mustn't take this lightly, Takumi. Saws. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Yeah, get freaking smacked! <laughs> Ayase had slapped me. My hopes and dreams were dashed in an instant. And in their place, anxiety arose. I felt like I was about to cry. Ayase was staring daggers at me, but I couldn't help but cling to her all the same. I, I, I'm sorry. Please don't hate me. Do not allow yourself to be dominated by your wicked heart. Let it instead be absorbed into yourself. If you do not, you will never awaken as a black knight. Never forget this. Uh, okay. Dude, you're the one freaking tonguing the guy. What are you talking about, you freaking wicked heart freaking? What are you saying to me right now? Dude, are you freaking out of your mind? Dude, this is some. This is something else. This is something else. Talk about double standards. Talk about hypocrisy. What the frick? Pretty sure the reason I'd gotten all turned on was because of the kiss. Not all this wicked heart stuff but I couldn't be bothered trying to argue with her. Let us go. G go where? That sound we heard. That was a gunshot. A gunshot? Here? In Japan? In a hospital? It hadn't sounded like one to me. Then again, I... I'd only ever heard them in movies and video, so it wasn't like I had any frame of reference as to what a real one sounded like. Even if that was a g gunshot, what do you expect us to do about it? This, too, has been foretold. The battle against the wicked-hearted king has already begun. The hearts of the Black Knights are soon to perish. So we must retrieve them. The D-Swords. That is the only thing we can do. 
the Black Knights were going to perish? Had that bullet we'd heard been fired at someone? We should call the p police. That would serve no purpose. The police have long since been dominated by wicked hearts. We were reaching unprecedented levels of schizo here. Ayase had completely lost it. The Gladio Saga was nothing more than a delusion of hers. Everything she'd said was nothing more than a delusion of hers. I had asked myself earlier what kind of ending she wished to reach. And I was still asking. Seriously, what was her end goal here? And what the heck was I supposed to do? Come now, Takumi. Ayase was already on her way out. I hesitated to follow her. But that was when I realized. Oh, true, I didn't notice that. The three D-swords leaning against the window were gone. Had she taken them with her? I bit my lip, hesitating for just a moment longer. But in the end, I decided to follow after her. Oh, man. Are we going to see Bond dead, dude? Dude, don't show me that, man. No, we are we're on the same rooftop. No, don't show me Bond dead. Don't do it to me, dude. That'll make me cry again. No. Ayase had gone straight for the rooftop. It was almost as if she knew exactly where the gunshot had come from. There was no hesitation as she walked. The hospital's roof had been turned into some sort of garden. The plants were all fully grown, and the flowers were in full bloom. But it was too dark to tell what color they were. I hid behind Ayase and took a look around. I couldn't sense anyone there. In fact, I didn't sense any signs of life at all. Had the gunshot really come from here? And if it had, who'd fired it? Guns weren't exactly common in Japan. We really should leave. If we stay, we might get ch shot. But Yase didn't listen to my pleas. Instead, she moved even farther into the garden, meaning I pretty much had to follow her. Huh. Uh-huh. And then, I saw a dim blue light in front of me. It was extremely faint, as if it'd go out at any moment. But it was undeniably there, flickering in the darkness. It is a D-sword. Huh? Oh, it's... Is that Bond's sword? What? Yeah, because he could... He had some different moments where he, like... Did some sort of, like, kind of... Uh, 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 Gigalomaniac stuff, right? Kind of? A little bit? Like, I know when the earthquakes happened, he got messed up, and but he was able to stay cognizant for them, I think. But he was getting hit by it when you and... and and, and, and Takami were getting hit by it, so like... Oh, dude, is this his sword? It was unendingly elegant. And yet, it possessed a razor-sharp edge, as if it longed to cut down all around it. Its presence was completely otherworldly. Two people were lying on the concrete near the D-sword. I recognized them. You are The girl in the school uniform, with eyes pointed up at the sky, was Yua. No doubt about it. What was she doing here? Oh, dude, did she save him? Wait, so that was her sword. I thought it looked like her sword a little bit, but I thought, no, it can't be, because she's on, a, like, a different building or whatever, right? But I guess this ending maybe had her do something different. And the other person was a middle-aged man. Looking at him closely, I realized that it was the same detective that had questioned me after the crucifixion case. 
They were both lying down on the ground, completely still. I carefully approached them. That was when I noticed the puddle of blood around them. Oh, I thought she maybe saved him. I jumped back in shock, but it was too late. The crimson liquid had already colored the bottom of my shoes. The detective's body was especially soaked in blood. Yua, on the other hand, didn't seem to be wounded. What the heck had happened here? Why were Yua and the detective together? Now that I knew there was a detective involved, the gunshot made more sense. But who had he shot at? Yua? A million questions were racing through my head. So many, in fact, that I couldn't even begin to organize them. I couldn't handle the confusion. So I turned to Ayase for help. Looking as solemn as ever, she ignored the detective and approached Yua's body. Stopping right in front of the pool of blood, she kneeled down beside Yua and felt her neck with her fingers. There is a pulse. Her body still lives. But her heart does not. It has perished. Oh, she died! What? As for the man, his end has already come. She was speaking in her usual indifferent tone. Oh, wait, so she said her heart, so does that mean, like, she's sad? So sad that she, like, is passed out or something? Is that what that means? <laughs> so she's not actually dead? She said she has a pulse, right? So I guess technically that, that's gotta be what it means. Aww. How can you be so calm right now? Th that guy is d d dead. It is as I said before. This has been foretold. The frick do you mean foretold? <laughs> Are you sure this isn't a delusion you wished would become reality or something? It is possible. But there is no way to know for certain. What? It is of no consequence. The origin matters not. Then, Ayase stood up. Oh no. Uh. And pulled her D-sword out of thin air. Uh. She took her D-sword, glowing bright red, and touched it against the D-sword that was stuck in the ground. Suddenly, a high-pitched resonance reverberated through the air. A resonance so shrill, it felt like a drill was carving a hole in my ear. Or at least, that was the image the feeling evoked. Immediately after the sound began, the shapes of the two D-swords began to effortlessly distort. Their transformation completely ignored the laws of physics. It was like they were made of liquid or clay. The two swords warped repeatedly, as if writhing in pain. The resonating sound only got worse. Unable to bear it, I tried plugging my ears, but it didn't help in the slightest. Ugh! Oh, what the frick? Until suddenly, a shockwave ripped through the air. Before I could even begin to understand what was happening, the D-sword in the ground was in Ayase's left hand. She called it to her like a second keyblade, dude. <sighs> Ayase must have been in agony. Her expression made that very clear. But only a moment later, she looked at me and smiled. She was even blushing slightly, almost like she was aroused or something. This is... the fourth one. Even though there were corpses right in front of her, and whoever shot the middle-aged detective was probably still nearby... How could she put that sword over literally everything else? 
Was it really that necessary to get the ending she wished to reach? Did she really need all seven D-Swords to defeat Gladiol? Did Gladiol even exist? Uh, all those who have become gigalomaniacs broke at some point in their lives. I remembered what Senna had told me. I supposed that meant Ayase had also broken at some point. Did that mean I'd eventually break too? Well, the eventually was probably unnecessary. After all, I already felt like I was going to break thanks to everything happening with Ayase. Ayase quickly erased the D-Swords. The two of them vanished, as if dissipating into the air itself. S so should we report this to the p police Yua was my enemy. I wouldn't lose any sleep about leaving her body here among all this carnage. But I had already stepped in the blood. My shoes were leaving red footprints all over the pavement. Which would yet again be enough to make me a suspect. We will not be doing that. A wave of relief washed over me. Ayase was gazing up at the night sky. Her expression still seemed slightly sorrowful. It is drawing near. Drawing near? <laughs> what was? According to Zeigler's prophecy, Gladiol's awakening is upon us. Be vigilant, Takami. A calamity is about to befall this world. You are about to experience a world, the likes of which you have never seen before. But you mustn't lose heart. The frick is this Kingdom Hearts? <laughs> if you do, overthrowing Gladio will be impossible. Ayase's voice lacked its usual composure. It was almost like she was scared. Would it really be that bad? Whatever was about to happen? Or should I say, the delusion that she was about to turn into reality? I I'm not ready yet. Then hurry and ready yourself. We are out of time. Ready myself? <laughs> Colonel, that's a little easier said than done. I don't even know what you think is supposed to happen. So what am I supposed to do? The worlds shall soon fuse. Their consolidation has begun. Ayase mumbled that to herself, looking up at the sky. I decided to look up at it too. Uh! In the sky, I could see a single spot dyed a vivid white. A white so bright, it stuck out like a sore thumb in the night sky. What even was that? I gulped. Come to think of it, had some people reported that the sky had turned white right before the last earthquake? The white spot was gradually expanding. It had an inexplicable sense of restlessness to it. It left me completely speechless. Gladiol has awakened. Oh! Oh, frick! It's real! Or she made it real, I guess, maybe. I... technically... The earth trembled. The building shook. No. It wasn't just the building shaking. Everything was. The white spot in the sky grew even bigger. Then... We were immediately assaulted by a violent buzzing noise, one that sounded similar to the resonance of the D-Sword from before. My head felt like it was about to explode. And then... Oh! Whoa! 
the world was dyed completely white. What the heck happened? Was I dreaming? Even though it had been white only a moment ago, the sky was dyed red. The world itself had turned into a rusty vermilion. This couldn't be real. It had to just be another delusion. Or at least, that was what I tried to tell myself. All across the sky, I could see clouds upon clouds of black miasma. They seemed almost humanoid in shape. They had to be illusions, though, even if they were unusually vivid. The clouds of haze spontaneously flickered in and out of sight. Even when I thought one had disappeared, it would pop up somewhere else a moment later. The blots of black miasma were innumerable. Just looking at them made me feel uncomfortable. And there was this intense, rotten-smelling stench. It was so bad, it nearly brought me to vomit. I didn't want to be here for even a second longer. That feeling was as strong as could be. When I came to... The sky had brightened up a little, and Shibuya had transformed into a city of death. A.H. Hospital was still standing, but cracks ran up the walls, and the interior was in complete disarray. I only barely managed to make it out. The entrance to the outpatient clinic was swarmed with ambulances. The place was overflowing with people trampling over each other, fighting for medical attention. When I'd woken up, Ayase had smiled at me and said, Let us return to Shibuya. It'd been just before 6 a.m. at that point, which meant that I'd been out for over ten hours. Yuwa's body was nowhere to be found. I asked Ayase if she knew what happened to it, but she didn't seem to know. Huh. Oh, dang. Yeah, we're back here again. Are we gonna get slaughtered by Dimi again, or...? Shibuya was hardly a five-minute train ride from Yoyogi. But due to the earthquake, all public transport was on halt. The railroad had been torn to shreds, meaning there was no way it was going to be restored within the day. So we were forced to walk. Something that was way harder than it sounds. The road was full of holes, and rubble from fallen buildings was constantly in our way. It was difficult to even walk in a straight line. As a result, the trip back to Shibuya Station ended up being a three-hour struggle. The surrounding area had been completely annihilated. Almost all of the buildings had collapsed. Countless bodies were strewn out all around us. They were so pitiful, I couldn't stand to look at them. There were also a number of people still alive. Some were like us, just wandering along in complete shock, while others were crouched in the rubble, waiting for help to arrive. And of course, there were many people clinging on to dead bodies as they bawled their eyes out. Even though they had all survived, they all still seemed dead, like the trauma had drained them of every ounce of life they'd once had. The terrible odor of blood and dust filled the air, making even the act of breathing completely unbearable. Was this Gladiol's doing? Was Gladiol the name of the earthquake, maybe? I suppose that would make sense. They always gave their hurricanes names in America, like Andrew or Katrina. Was this how Ayase wanted things to end? Was this the ending she wished to reach? Then again, if you wanted to bring about the apocalypse, this would probably be the best way to do it. But there was no way a single person could cause a catastrophe on this scale, 
even with the power of a gigalomaniac. Or a black knight, as Ayase liked to call them. She'd said that the worlds shall fuse, and all shall be consolidated, or whatever. But what exactly had she meant by that? While following behind Ayase through the city, I took a peek at the side of her face. Unsurprisingly, even Ayase had turned pale when faced with the current state of Shibuya. She walked in silence, clenching her jaw as if trying to endure an intense pain. Listen up, everyone! This place is dangerous! We all have to hurry to the evacuation site! A middle-aged man in a suit was screaming into the crowd. He was calling out to all the survivors in the area, us included. If you stay here waiting for help, night'll hit before you know it. But if you go now, you can make it to the evacuation site before then. Please, don't stay here any longer. Even if it hurts to stand, you've got to get up and get out of here. We've already escaped death once now, and we owe it to the dead to keep on living. Where the heck had that old guy gotten so much energy from? A few people listened and started moving toward him, but most people stayed put. Ayase didn't even look at him. She just kept on moving toward her destination. And I had no choice but to follow. Suddenly, I felt a throbbing pain in my forehead. Ever since we'd left Yoyogi, I'd been getting headaches just like this. Please stand up! Why aren't you listening? It's dangerous! You could get crushed by the rubble! I just want you all to survive! My head... hurt. Oh! What the... Suddenly, the world was dyed red once more. The sky was covered by vermilion clouds. It was the exact same thing I'd seen in my dream. The asphalt of the road, the concrete of the debris, the buildings, the shattered glass on the ground, the abandoned, broken-down cars, the uprooted trees from the sidewalk. All of it had been corroded, overtaken by rust. Oh, frick. <laughs> Maniacal laughter echoed throughout the area. It was coming from the same person who had been trying to get everyone to take refuge just a second ago. His body was covered in a cloud of black miasma. But it wasn't just him. Excluding the dead bodies, there were clouds of miasma around everyone I could see. The hazes were nearly human-sized. They swayed back and forth rhythmically, each one unusually vivid. It was a horrifying sight. It was exactly like my dream. <laughs> that man's laughter was starting to annoy me. Looking back toward him, I noticed that, for some odd reason, he had an assault rifle pointed straight at me. The police are gone so I can kill as many people as I want. <laughs> he started spraying bullets. <laughs> Holy crap. I immediately hit the ground. I'd been shot. Or so I thought. I had undoubtedly been standing right in his line of fire. But I didn't feel any pain. I lifted up my head to double check. Please, just go to the evacuation site. They have water, food, and blankets too. There's no reason to stay here. Interesting, so he's, he's jumping between two different realities. That's really weird. What the heck? He wasn't holding a gun anymore. He was just... 
pleading with the crowd around him. So please, keep on fighting to survive. Don't die in the- But it all changed so suddenly. For a split second, the man's body was covered in static. Before the static, he'd had his hand raised up in the air. But after it, that hand was holding a gun. Doing that so quickly was humanly impossible. It was barely even coherent. It couldn't possibly be real. It was almost like watching a movie with severely jarring jump cuts. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started firing again. The people that were shot fell to the ground, blood spurting everywhere. Their screams echoed through the air. And yet, somehow, none of the bullets were hitting me. It really felt like I was in a movie. It wasn't real life. So he's seen like a, a partial delusion. He's kind of like... So he's not really there, he's just kind of there, I guess? Like, kind of like, in and out of existence, almost like transparent, if you will, so you can see him, but you can't touch him? Is that what's going on? What the heck? Takumi? When I heard my name, I came back to my senses. Ayase was staring at me. She looked like she was about to say something, but in the end, she didn't. She simply turned her back and kept on walking. I took a look at the sky. It was cloudy, but not red. The surrounding scenery was overcast by a dark gray. No vermilion in sight. The shooter had gone back to pleading with everyone to evacuate. All the people who had been shot were now unharmed, and none of them were engulfed by black miasmata. What the heck had just happened? Another one of my delusions? If it actually had been, then I must have really lost my touch. That delusion hadn't even been slightly realistic. It'd been like a movie or a video game or something. Takumi, hurry. Ayase urged me forward. Where the heck was she going anyway? Was she headed for the evacuation site? The one that guy was yelling about? Yo, what is happening? But if that was true, then she wasn't going the right way. Instead, she went right into the Inokashira line station. What the heck was she thinking? What the frick? Oh, are we gonna have to fight Sua again? There were no staff members at the station, and the trains were all stopped in place. Ayase made her way down to the tracks and started walking along them. Naturally, the tunnel was pitch black. It wasn't designed to be traversed on foot, after all. It hadn't collapsed yet, but it felt like it was only a matter of time before it did. I would have never imagined that I'd have ended up walking on railroad tracks like this. What an adventure, though. They should make a movie about it. Wait, pretty sure there already was one. Granted, it'd come out before I was born, so I obviously hadn't seen it. I just knew it was about some people walking down railroad tracks to find a body. Oh, is he talking about Stand By Me? Ha ha ha! The kids or whatever going to try and find that body from... Yeah, okay, that's funny. <laughs> nice little reference. Meanwhile, walking through this underground tunnel wasn't nearly as exciting. If we continued along this route, we'd eventually pass by the Shinsen, Komaba, Todai Mae, Ikenoe, <laughs> and Shimoki... Tazawa stations. Getting in and out of Shibuya had been made incredibly difficult, so using the subway tunnels was actually a pretty good escape plan. 
but we had started in Yoyogi, and now we were heading toward Shibuya. So something told me that Ayase wasn't using this as an escape route. Um, where are we going? Shinsen Station. What the heck was the point of going there? Maybe she was planning on heading to Suimei from there? Or maybe my base? Actually, I'd, I'd never told her where my base was, so probably not the second one. Speaking of which, I wondered if Seraton had survived. What if the Kurenai Conference Hall had collapsed because of the earthquake? Oh, frick! All my poor waifus could be buried in rubble! <laughs> oh my gosh. Suddenly, my trivial concerns were interrupted by a bright light. There was a railroad crossing right before Shinsen Station, where light from the sky peeked in from above. After the crossing, the rails went into another dark tunnel, and after that was the Shinsen Station platform. The lights at the platform were out, likely due to the earthquake. It was pretty darn dark. There was almost no one around. All I could see were two girls sitting on the platform. Judging by their uniforms, they were Suemei students. Oh, he missed them. He wasn't able to save them. Oh, no, because he was freaking making out with freaking Ayase in the closet, dude. What the frick? Ayase approached them without a hint of hesitation. Maybe she knew them or something. As we got closer, their figures in the darkness became clearer. My brow furrowed. I felt like I had seen them somewhere before. And then I realized exactly who they were. Senna! Kozapi! But something was wrong with them. They should have been able to hear us coming, but they didn't even turn around to look at us. No. They just sat there. Their heads looking down at the ground. Not moving. S Senna? Kozapi? I tried calling out to them, but the two still didn't respond. What the heck was up with them? Dude, their brains got mushed. The hearts of the Black Knights are soon to perish. So we must retrieve them. The D-Swords. Oh, yeah, because we didn't get to them in time. Oh, because of you and your stinking delusions. Wait. No freaking way! I rushed over to the girls in a panic, then peered into Senna's eyes. Ah! Senna's eyes were devoid of life. They were completely hollow. With no light left within them, they stared into nothingness. Those sharp eyes of hers, always glaring at everyone and everything. Not a single trace of them remained. She was trying to murmur something, but her voice was so incredibly faint, all that came out was a mere croak. I couldn't make out a single word she'd said. Kozapi was the same. The light in her eyes had died out. Her mouth hung open. Drool trickled down her cheek. She tried to speak, but her voice was too hoarse to understand. Something had happened to them. What the heck was going on in this city? I was absolutely clueless, so I turned to Ayase for answers. But she didn't seem remotely interested in their fates. Their D-swords were lying nearby. Ayase took her own sword and brought it near them. The same shrill sound from before reverberated throughout the station. The three D-swords began to warp and transform. Whoa! Dude, is she gonna combine all the swords into like one giant Megazord sword or something, dude? Then came the shockwave. 
assaulting my body like a fierce gust of wind. And once it passed, Ayase was holding Senna's and Kozapi's D-swords. That makes six. Blushing in apparent arousal, Ayase looked at me. Takumi, the only one left is yours. You must obtain it. How the heck could she be so calm right now? My frustration was then met by the same throbbing pain in my head as before. The world turned red once again. Everything began rusting, rotting, and eroding away. I could smell a strong odor coming from Kozapi. Kozapi slowly rose up from the ground. Her entire body was dyed red. Was that blood? Or rust? Oh! Kozapi's gonna kill you. Kozapi raised her head. Her face was covered in a black miasma. The sheer bloodthirst coming from her was terrifying. Kozapi stretched out her thin arms, as if to try and strangle me. But when I blinked, she had somehow ended up back on the ground, her head hanging downward. She had an indescribable expression on her face. What the frick? Kozapi's gonna kill you. Uh! Static rang in my ears and Kozapi instantly teleported beside me. The black miasma grazed my shoulder. A ghastly cold sent a chill down my spine. Kozapi's gonna kill everyone. You're next, Takamishan. Kozapi's mirror will shred you to pieces. Her whispers were emotionless and robotic but that only made them all the more horrifying. I blinked once more. Senna's body was slumped over on the ground. She had been cut to pieces. Kozapi violently swung down her arms and stabbed Senna in the head with a shard of glass. What the frick is happening? Dark blood stained Senna's long, beautiful black hair. Kozapi then raised the piece of glass in the air and stabbed her once more. Uh. Static. Now Kozapi was on the ground instead of Senna, and... Senna had mounted a homeless man that had appeared out of nowhere. Her head was buried in his shoulder. Her head was moving up and down constantly. What was she doing? Her hair was covering her face, so... I couldn't really tell. That is, until she finally looked up. The man's shoulder was stained in blood. His flesh was minced like ground beef, and I could even make out a little bit of pink muscle glittering from within. Wait. No. Was it blood? Muscle? Rust? Death. You taste... So good. Senna finally turned around, and I could now see the blood surrounding her mouth. She was chewing on something, devouring it. Yo, what the frick? I, I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless right now. I don't even know what he's experiencing. What, what is happening? Ever since that big beam happened, he's, he's been freaking out. My legs trembled, and the second I lost my balance and collapsed to the ground, the world returned to its original color. My headache vanished too. I pressed my hand against my forehead and shook my head intensely. I felt extremely sick, like I was about to vomit. It didn't really feel like a panic attack or shock or anything like that. It was more like... A poison was slowly trickling through my veins, spreading through my entire body. One that hit me with a horrible, sinking feeling that weighed heavily on my mind. I raised my head 
and looked at Senna and Kozapi. They were still where they had been originally, on the ground, motionless. What happened? Ayase held out her hand. It was the same look from earlier, one that told me she had something more to say. I took her hand and stood up from the ground. <laughs> 